There we go. Hey, great. I've gone great. Great. <laughs> yeah. Shaking. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. Pastoring will do that to you. <laughs> oh, man. It's so good to be back, hey? Um, yeah, I was part of Revolution uh, a long time ago. And so it's good to be back with family. And I've uh, been in Auckland for about 10 years, just moved to Nelson. And uh, Steve and Amy are good friends. We go back a long time before you guys were married, actually, which is quite a long time ago. <laughs> but so, so cool. I just, I just loved what uh, Steve said before, uh, how he's talking about Tom Holland. He was talking about the world looking at the church. And I was actually up on Victoria Park uh, the other day, I haven't been there for ages, and just, just felt to drive up there and just pray over the city. And sometimes when I've been up there over, over, over years, I would get the sense of God's thumbprint on the city, just this enormous thumb over the city. Uh, Christ's church, uh, the furthermost city from Jerusalem. It's just, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, but as I was just there and I was uh, praying... Um, uh, there's kind of like, I don't know, it was a weird weather pattern yesterday. There was kind of like almost a Norwest arch going on. And uh, I'm a Christchurch boy from way back, so I just love the Christchurch sky. And as I'm looking out, I, you know, it's kind of like the, the foothills, nor- uh, you know, as you go north, we're all sort of in shadow. And there's this band of light. And, and this light just suddenly streamed down and it actually lit up a valley that was hidden and, and as the light shone on it, you could suddenly see the depth and the relief of the land going right back through. And you never even knew it was there. And I think some people are like that with the church. And I think the world's like that with the church. They go, we know there's something there, but we don't really know what it is. Until it gets illuminated. And, and in Isaiah, it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the risen Lord will shine upon you. And I think the world is waiting. It says in the word that the world is waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And he is looking to glorify his church in this time. And, and you know, when, when the light of God shines, when we truly shine, people see it, they go, That's beautiful. So would you just pray with me this morning? And right now we are, I just want you just to, to, to lean into him a little bit. And get a sense of his heart towards you because he loves you. And he really is preparing his church and his bride to pour his glory upon Upon us, so that the world might see. But he wants to prepare hearts and he wants to awaken hearts. And I really believe this morning that God is wanting to speak to your heart today because he's so intensely interested in our hearts. Because out of the heart flow the issues of life. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. And so, with with me this morning, could we just lean into him and just say, Father, we, we welcome your gaze. We welcome your embrace. And Lord, that you would prepare us as a church, but as individual sons and daughters of yours. Some of us who may just be visiting may not even really know you, but Lord, Thank you that you've called us here and that you're preparing us, Lord, so that the world would see a God of love who yes. pursues us. Yes. Come on, wait while you're just sitting there, just say, thank you, Lord, that you love me, that you've chased me down, that you pursue me with your love. Lord, help me to see what you want me to see today. Mm. Yeah, even even that picture of that that the valley that was hidden and the light shining. I, I just believe for some this morning, God is going to shine a light on some things, and He's just going to help you to see some stuff that you didn't see before about how He loves you, 
about how good he is, about what he has for you, about things that are blocking you, and things that he wants to do. And so we welcome that this morning, Lord. We welcome that this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen. John chapter 4, if, you, if you've got your devices or if um, you're old school and you've actually got a Bible, well done. <laughs> John chapter, uh, first, first John chapter 4 says, uh, at verse 7, I'll start at verse 7, even though probably on the screen it starts at verse 13, but we'll get there. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and um, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. So he's wanting you to know this is how, all right? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We think we know what love is, and and the writer here, John, is trying to say, no, 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 let me show you what love really is. He's like, I really want you to know, this is how God showed his love, and this is love, the kind of love that sends his son, that, that sacrifices. And dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, then God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Do you see that it's not independent? That you can't come and say, I've got a relationship with God and I love God and he loves me and not love the people around you because it's really clear that actually we're connected. In fact, Jesus prays that in John 17. He says, pray, Father, that they will be one just as you and I are one. That's his whole plan, is that we're one and that we live in love. And so we pick up a verse 13 and it says, and this is how we know that we live in. Do you see what he's doing? He's going, he's going, this is how God showed his love. And this is love. And this is how we know. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know. He just really wants us to know. He really wants you to know this morning. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. I'll say that again. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. I have relied on a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Just me. (laughs) (laughs) And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And as I said this morning, I I really feel that God wants to speak to hearts this morning, not just your head. Because he's really interested in what ticks around on the inside and what takes place inside of here. Because, you know, we often talk about revival, you know, like we like talking about revival in the church and we, we use those words, revival, renewal, all that kind of stuff. But, but God's actually looking to revive this. This is revival. Yeah. Yeah. This is revival. It, it, you know, we, we describe revival as a, as a move like Asbury or, or that kind of thing. But actually, do you notice what that is? That is, that is an awakening of the heart. Yeah. You know, I, um, I grew up here in Christchurch and uh, I grew up in a, in a Christian family and a good family. And I lived with love all around me, but I was not able to accept it. You see, I was adopted when I was nine months old. I had a mum. I knew her. I knew the sound of her. I knew the smell of her. I knew her embrace. And at nine months, I was adopted out, and I never saw her again. Spent nine, you spend nine months bonding to your natural mother and then she's gone. And I was adopted into a good family and, you know, 
uh, good people, and there were reasons why that she needed to adopt me out. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful because I'm actually here today because God placed me. It says that he, he places the orphans and families. That's what the scripture says. Maybe you're not an orphan, but maybe you feel like you don't know where you fit or where you belong. Maybe you know what it's like to feel orphanhood. I, I, I got placed in a family, and I'm so gr- grateful for that. But what happened is that it, in some way the damage had been done inside of my heart that I grew up, and although I had love all around me, it didn't, it didn't go in. It was like the damage had somehow been done, and the sense that I grew up with was a sense of I don't belong. It's like you, as you grow up, you, you're sort of looking, like, looking to fit in. And fitting in, by the way, is a counterfeit of belonging. Fitting in is where I change me so that you like me. And so I, I, I spent the early years, and, and I just, actually, no, I'll be honest, <laughs> I say early years, I spent m- most of my years trying to fit in. I got into ministry and you know, leading youth and all kinds of stuff and helping people. And, and you know, I could tell my story about you know, adoption and uh, but it was like I still, in the deep place of me, I, I just, I didn't know if I belonged and I didn't know love. And it's an amazing thing that you, you know, there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Yeah. You can be alone, like, you know, you can be by yourself and be quite happy in your own skin. And, you, you know, you've got a sense that you're okay and that you belong in this world. And, you know, you might have a relationship with God and you know that he loves you and you feel content but you can be in a crowd and feel incredibly lonely. Yeah. I know what that's like. So, I, you know, I, as I say, I grew up, got into, into ministry. And, and, and it, you know, I had every reason to feel like I was loved. I had good parents and, you know, three sisters. Sometimes it was like having four mothers, if you know what I mean. <laughs> But, you know, I was surrounded by love, but there was a, 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 a trauma or a, like a, a developmental trauma in my life. And no, no one who's not been adopted knows what it's like not to grow up with your blood relatives, and neither should you. But it's something, even if you have a good adoption... There's stuff to work through and stuff to deal with. There's stuff that happens to the heart of an infant that you carry. And I, 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 as, I, you know, as Steve said, I counsel, and oftentimes what I'm finding as I, as I talk to people is that a lot of what's going on today is not about today, but it's about wounds that happened when they were young in their younger years. Could be really little, could be you know, even, even you know, more recent. But the thing is, is that you just walked every day of your life carrying that pain. You never had an opportunity to put it down. And so then you end up and you're 60 and you're looking around and you're like, I still feel like a child when I walk into this situation. I still feel like a little kid. And it's because that wound never got healed. You just carried it every day of your life. And that was me. I just carried that wound every day of my life. And, and you know, I, you can't reason your way out of that. Because, you know, if you think about it, if reason had worked, you would have reasoned your way out of it by now. It's just like, you know, if drinking had worked, you know, you, you would have drunk your way out of your problems by now. If drugs had worked, you would have doped your way out of the problems until now, you know? You know? If serving in church had worked, then you would have served your way into love by now. You feel like you're enough. Sorry, I just thought I'd throw that in. We need an on going, like, reframing experience where we encounter love. And so, yeah, so you ended up living without love. And what I discovered this is, you know, that, you know, the Bible says that you're created in the image of God. They they use this term, imago Dei, which you won't find in Scripture, but it is a term that describes in the image of God. Now, God is love. The word is agape, by the way, which is perfect love. It's perfect love. It's divine love. This is God is love. Now, here's the thing. If you're uncomfortable with God in some way, then probably you're uncomfortable with love because God is love. 
And if you're uncomfortable with love, then you probably struggle to love yourself. And if you're struggling to love yourself, then you're probably struggling to love other people. I know for me, I just was on a long quest for a long time to try and get a sense of, of actually loving myself. And I didn't realize that actually I had to die to that quest and realize that there was a perfect love waiting for me. If you don't believe you're lovable, then you know it's hard to receive Father God's love. Yeah. And so we end up settling for counterfeits. Yeah. You know, we... Someone said to me, a friend of mine said to me a while ago, he said, we live out of the story that we tell ourselves the most. As I grew up, I told myself that I wasn't enough, that I didn't belong, and that I wasn't loved. So you live out of that story. It becomes a subtext going on in your life. And, and so what we do when we don't know that we're loved, what we do is we look for counterfeits to give us a feeling of love and a feeling like we're actually, because everybody wants love. At the end of the day, when you peel it all back and, and you look at friends, relatives, your own life and the things people get into and the things people do, what they're really searching for is to know in the deepest place that they're loved, yeah. that, that actually that somebody would see them and in the middle of, of, of even their darkest moments that they'd go, and I still love you. Yeah. 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 And so... What I did is I looked for a counterfeit. And there's so many counterfeits that we can have. I, I wonder if I was to ask you this morning, what's in your, what in your life is actually giving you a sense of feeling loved or feeling that warm feeling, but it's never deeply settled? I wonder what would come to mind. Performance is a good one. It can be a counterfeit because if I perform well enough in my job, if I perform well enough for my family, if I perform well enough for my, in my relationship, if I you know, perform well enough in ministry, then people will like me and give me the big tick of approval and I'll get that sense of I'm loved and I'm okay. But it's a counterfeit because then when you step away from the pulpit, you step away from behind your work desk, you know, you get, a, you get a, a bad email from your boss saying, I just want to give you some feedback, you know, and it's like a, your world comes crumbling. It's like as you, are, you are getting that sense of affirmation, and then it's gone. And I've, I've attached my worth and my value to my performance. What about addictions? You know, often I talk to people who, who battle with pornography or sexual addictions, and one of the things I find is, is that what it gives them is a, is a, a feeling of intimacy. And I've said if you step outside your body and you were just to watch yourself, what would you notice? Ah, oh, I'm all alone when I do that. It's counterfeit. Yeah. It doesn't really give you a sense of connection. It doesn't give you a sense of love. Toxic relationships, like why do people go back and back and back? Better the devil you know than the, I don't know. Maybe it's that, but there's actually a, a it's it's a counterfeit for real yeah. love because there's a sense of I'm not probably worthy for that. Probably not really worthy of love. But at least he holds me, you know. At least at least she keeps you know keeps coming back to me. Whatever. Religious activity. That's a really good one. Religious activity. Man. You know, I, I'm really grateful for the church that I, that I grew up in and the church that my family went to. Uh, Matthew, I don't know where you are, but you grew up in the same church as me. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, there was plenty, plenty of religious activity. But actually, uh, I, I discovered that the that, that Holy Spirit was wooing me and drawing me, that there was something more, that there was a heart connection he wanted to have with me. Uh, and I found that when I was 16, and I might even talk to you about that tonight, I don't know, we'll see what happens. But, but religious activity gives you a sense for a moment that, that maybe I'm okay and maybe I'm enough, but it's not enough, because again, it's based on performance. 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... 
I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and can do all the cool stuff, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. Do you know, people read this scripture in, in weddings. I've done it myself. And, uh, and we hear this word love and we read it through the context of our culture of love. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about God's love, exclusively God's love. It's saying that I can have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have faith that could remove mountains, but have not God's perfect love. He's saying, I'm integral to this. You need to know my love. It's my agape love. It's my divine love, my perfect love. And it says, and though I give my body to be burned, in other words, I can be a martyr, but if I don't have God's perfect love, then it profits me nothing. I can do all these cool things. You know, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody martyr themselves, you know, without God's love inside of here? What's the point? What's the, the purpose? But it's an interesting thought. I mean, what, why would somebody go to the mission field? A lot of people, missionaries, go to the mission field. Why would they go to the mission field but be emotionally shut down and disconnected and not be affectionate and loving towards the people they're ministering to? It's a true story. Not for everybody, but it is a true story. Why would, why would a pastor, like pastor people, and then disconnect or neglect or even abuse their family? <laughs> I have conversations, you know. It's shocking, you know. It's like, wow. Because, because they're trying to reach for a counterfeit of love. That I'll yeah. do ministry, ministry, ministry. I read a book by a guy called Jack Frost, and he's... Uh, he wrote, wrote this book called uh, The Father's Embrace, Experiencing the Father's Embrace. Such a good book. But he was, uh, he was the angriest, nastiest fishing boat captain you ever met. They called him the Captain Bly of the Sea. He'd take his fishing crews out off the coast of America and, uh, you know... He would drive his crew harder and further through storms, risking their lives, and he just loved that sense of, man, you're a bad dude. And uh, he was married, but he was you know, just an angry man, a man who was addicted to all kinds of things. His family was suffering. And, and you know, he finds Jesus, and and. Instantly, like all these addictions are gone. Like he just has a deliverance moment. All these addictions are gone, and and then <laughs> he becomes the baddest, angriest, nastiest pastor you've ever met. <laughs> and he just he talks about how he just he would go to conferences and you know he was a hard like law and hellfire and brimstone preacher and he would you know and and drive his volunteers and all this kind of thing and and then if someone else's church his church was struggling he'd secretly celebrate that was like what he'd say like well, I, I know we're just being really honest about the dark things that happen in the heart of a pastor but I yeah honest with you I know what that feels like when you feel like you're struggling and then someone else is struggling you go ah. Oh, yeah, maybe I'm not doing so bad, you know. It's kind of that, those little dark things in your heart, you know. Mm. Am I being a little bit too honest? I'm sorry. Like, is it, you know, I'm not really sorry. Keep it coming. And, uh, and, and, you know, when he was, his wife, their marriage was terrible and his wife was really struggling and he was like, she's just got emotional problems. And so he took her to this conference one weekend which was, you know, about you know, healing the heart or something like that. He was like, this will sort her out. <laughs> <laughs> you got to read it. It's hilarious. So good. And, uh, and he said he's standing there, and yeah, his wife was, you know, crying. And, and, uh, and then someone stands up and, and says, there are men in this room who've never experienced an embrace from a father who loves them. And right now, the Heavenly Father is coming to embrace you and to show you his love. And he says, I crumpled onto the floor as I felt the arms of God's embrace. And I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I cried for two weeks. Wow. And, and I repented to my wife and I just had an encounter with God's love, and I couldn't say sorry to her enough and to my kids. And, and he, said, he said, three months later, 
his daughter had to do an assignment at school, a little you know, assignment, on who was, you know, who was your hero. And she writes this assignment and she says, my hero is my dad because he used to be a captain Bly of the sea, but now he is the lovingest, most gentlest, kindest man I've ever met. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. And that's what happens when you encounter the Father's heart. Is not only does he heal you, but you begin to reflect him. You know, I, I know what it's like to settle for a counterfeit of love and a whole lot of ways, and success was one of them, you know, as a pastor. If I could get enough bums on seats, you know, then I'd be good enough, and people would like me, and I, you know, my peers in ministry would like me. And you know, if we have X number of people in life groups, if we have X number of programs going on, if things are polished, then, then I'll be enough. And, uh, and, I, and I had to go on this journey where I realized that the limelight wasn't going to give me a sense of love wasn't really going to meet the deep need inside of me. That I had to go on an honest journey with God and be honest with myself and honest with Him. And, 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 and actually, then if I would do that, then I could actually step out into the sunlight hmm. instead of the limelight. Right. That I could know His love and His embrace. And, and that, you know, we get things backwards. We do things for love but you're destined to live out of love. Yeah, yeah. So good. You know, there's this phrase we talk about intimacy, you know, intimacy with God. It's kind of a weird concept for people. Mostly when people talk to me about intimacy, they're talking about sex. Because that's how the world, you know, we were intimate. So, we, you know, in other words, we had sex. But intimacy is actually not sex. It's uh, it's something that's a lot deeper. We think about romance. We think about something that happens behind closed doors. But, but intimacy is actually to know and to be known. Yeah. To be known in the deepest place. Yeah. It's deeper than sex, which is just physical. It's deeper than, than just like we have some commonality. We, you know, we play sport together. We know the same thing. It's, it's, deeper, it's deeper than we're family, than we're, you know, kind of connected. Uh, it's actually even deeper than you're significant to me, you're special to me. It's actually deeper than I love you, but it's, 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 it's getting there, that selfless love. But, but true intimacy is this place where there's no walls, yeah. where I don't have to hide anymore, when actually you get to see the ugly parts yeah. and I'm still loved anyway. Yeah. 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 And that's the relationship that we have with God. Because he knows and he sees, he sees your struggle, your pain, and he loves you. And, I, and, I, and I, I didn't know that I needed that love and that embrace in the deepest, darkest place, yeah. in the place where I felt alone, mm. lost and rejected. That actually, if I knew that, I could let go of the counterfeits. Mm. You know... Um, Adam, Adam and Eve walked with this intimacy with God. And I think, you know, out of everything, you know, you know, probably know the story how there's a tree of life in the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and they make this choice to, to not trust God and, and not eat of that tree. They chose to eat of that tree and, and determine for themselves what was right and wrong, not trust God's definition of it. That's what happened. And I think that, the, you know, sin enters the world and, and sin and death and, uh, you know, and they're out of the garden, that kind of thing. I think the greatest tragedy in that and the thing that got, broke God's heart the most and the thing that God worked to restore was the rift that happened, the disconnection. We were never designed to be disconnected. And, and what happened then is that for Adam and Eve, there's that sense of I'm alone, that sense of orphanhood. And, and, and I can trust me, like I, I, I know what this is like, that sense of, 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 you know, yes, I'm in a great family, I'm surrounded by love, but, but actually that, that orphanhood, when you, when you feel like an orphan, you know one thing, that you're all alone and that you have to look after number one. And that's how the world lives. And, and actually, he just wants to encounter you and I in that deep place. 
And even Jesus said the son can do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the father doing. The son was totally reliant on relationship with God. You and I are no different. And if you're in Jesus, then you're not an orphan. You have a father. You have, I'm going to say a mother. Some of you are going to struggle with that. But the mother heart of God, when you look at Holy Spirit, the intimacy, the tenderness, the gentleness, the gentle heart of God. We don't, you know, we don't often preach about gentleness from the pulpit because it doesn't preach well in Pentecostal churches. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you can't be gentle, you've got no business running a ministry in the church. Just put that out there. Sorry if that's a little bit blunt, but... If we can't be gentle with people, you know, oh, we can't tolerate sin. <laughs> we use these phrases and we think we can avoid other parts of Scripture. It's just the heart of God, the gentleness of God. Hmm. Jesus, the elder brother, you've got a family. You've got a family. Someone special in my life, I was praying up on the hill and they said, oh, you're by yourself? And I was like, no, there's four of us. <laughs> You discover you don't have to look after number one anymore. Yeah. You can stop the quest. Yeah. Yeah. I get to know and rely on the love of God. And so we know and rely on the love of God. Yeah. For me, it was 2018 when the wheels came off. I, uh, I was pastoring and I decided that I would train in counselling. And uh, like any you know, person who starts training and counselling, we think we want to help other people and that would be great and we're blissfully unaware of what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, so I'm doing an assignment on, uh, on common issues you know, that come up in, in counselling and you know, um, you know, whether family violence or suicidality or you know, grief and loss or any of those things. And you have to do an assignment on... Uh, on, on a personal issue, you know, and relate it to one of these common issues, you know, personal story related to common issues. And I was like, well, I can talk about my adoption because I know that story really well. And, and I can tell that, and man, it helps people, and it's good, and I can just do that. That'll be an easy assignment for me. And, and, um, and I, I was thinking, what issue would I relate to that? I was like, what, what issue would relate to, to, to adoption? And I was like, which one does that fit into? And I was blissfully unaware. And so I, I rung Belinda Stock. And I was like, Belinda, what issue would you relate to, you know, adoption? And she said, um, typically grief and loss. And I thought, ah, oh, yeah, I can probably do something on that. And I was like, so disconnected, eh? And, uh, and so I, I start writing this thing, and then just suddenly I'm not doing so well. And I'm starting to read about people who've been adopted and about what, you know, what they walk through, and I start relating and I start relating to this sense of kind of undercurrent of depression going through your whole life. And I relate to anxiety and, and I'm going, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing so well. I'm, uh, and I didn't want to be at church meetings <laughs> for a bit. I was like going, oh, I'm not doing so good. And I, I rang my auntie and my auntie's kind of, she's a counsellor. She's like, she's just about to be 80 this year. And uh, she's uh, like a spiritual mum to half the pastors in Auckland. And uh, she's just really cool. And um, she's also really straight up. <laughs> she was like, Steve, have you ever really thought deeply about the fact that you're adopted? And I wanted to say, yeah, yeah, but I know better than to kind of pull that one with her. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I, I guess not. And, uh, and as I began to meditate on it, I had a vision, I had a picture of my birth mother from a photo. And I started to cry, and the tap turned on, and it was like this well of sorrow opened up that I had lived with all my life. All my life. And I sat down, and I had one last meeting with an elder at a cafe, and I was just barely holding it together. I went home, and I just wrote a letter to her. And I thanked her. She died about three years after I was adopted, but she found Jesus. She found church. People embraced her and 
and they'll meet her one day. But the lid came off. And uh, I ended up going away for the day, and I took this letter. And as I'm going out of town, the Lord speaks to me, says, pick up some bread and some wine. And I'm like, well, what do you mean, like, for communion? Isn't that to remember you? He's like, yeah, I want you to remember me in your grief. Wow. Oh. I get out there on the a beach, and I light a little fire and take communion. Like, I actually burnt the letter as a way of sending it to her, you know. Just a way of connecting with my grief. And suddenly I began to encounter the presence of God in such a deep way. And I discovered a part of him that he reserves only for those going through grief and loss. Mm -hmm. That he relates to you in that space because he knows what it's like to let go of his own son. Because he knows what it's like to grieve. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I get home, I'm still like the lid won't come back on. Someone says, like, you, you, should get a, you should get a batch and go away for the weekend. Within like half a day, I had a free batch up in Kitty Kitty. So I packed everything in my car and my dive gear, because I was a spear fisherman, and I'm like, right, I'm going to this batch. And as, as I'm driving, sometimes the tears are coming, I get to this batch and I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Shack, but I had a shack experience. I don't want to weird you out. There weren't three people walking around. It wasn't quite like that. You know? It's a lady like, I'm God the Father. It wasn't like, it wasn't like that. <laughs> but, uh, but I got there and he was there. And he started doing all these weird things. It's like I'm cooking dinner and then there's this bookshelf. And like there isn't any kiwi batch, and I'm just standing there, and I run my hand down the books like this, and my hand stops, and I pull out a book, and I open it up and start to read, and it's a story about a middle-aged man grieving the loss of his mother. Wow. And as I read, I just wept, and I grieved, and I felt the presence of God. I wanted to get up early next morning, 7 o'clock. I looked at the tide time. I want to go diving. Uh, and uh, and I'm like, I have to get up at 7 o'clock to do this because I want to go to Marsden Cross as well. And, uh, and so I set my alarm, except I didn't set it properly. So it didn't go off. But at 7 o'clock on the dot, the smoke alarm downstairs goes beep, beep, like this. It's 7 o'clock on the dot. And I'm laughing. And I can feel his presence. I get out, I get my, my dive gear, I've got like an hour and a half, I'm like, God, I want to shoot a really big kingfish and a really big snapper in an hour and a half. And I'm out there swimming around, I bait up an area with Kinner, and, uh, you know, and then I kind of go a bit further up the coast, and then these kawai go smash, smash, past me like this, and I'm like, oh, like this, I speak again, and I'm excited, and I'm like, no discipline, I just got to wait, you know. I want to shoot a kingfish, and straight after them, this huge kingfish comes past, and I go, bang, smacked it over. I'm like, wow, and I'm wrangling this kingfish, and, uh, and then I'm like, right, I better go and check the area that I, that I ground baited, and I come back, and up over this little reef, and I look down, and there's this huge snapper in there, and I shoot this huge snapper, and I'm, and I'm just lying in the water, and I'm laughing because I'm fishing with my dad. I can feel his presence. Get back to the batch. I'm like, right, we're going to Marsden Cross. I'm not going to take my bread and my wine. I'm going to have communion. I'm going to grieve at Marsden Cross, except that's not what happened. I get in the car, and then it's like, Poo! and it's like the tears. Like, I, tell you, I need windscreen wipers for my eyes. I'm like, this is inconvenient. <laughs> I always can't see when I'm driving. I, and I get to Marsden Cross, and it switches off like a tap. And he's like, right, I want to show you some things. And he takes me for a walk around and begins to speak about the foundation of the gospel in New Zealand and, 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 and revival and outpouring and that kind of thing. And I started a journey with my father that day where I encountered a lo his love in a deep place. And it took probably three months to step back from church. And then when I came back, it was like God had done a healing work inside of me. It was a transforming encounter. Can I have the team up today? Is that right? 1 John 4, 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. It's like that sense of I've failed, I've, I deserve judgment, I, I'm not enough. 
The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And I discovered this. If there's fear in your life, it's just that there's an area which is yet to be made perfect in his perfect love. And I want to invite you this morning to encounter that. As we worship, as, when we, as we begin to sing, nothing else will do. I just want you. I want to invite you to respond this morning. And the team's going to come and just stand with you. And, you know, there's no formulas, right? Because God knows you. He knows what the counterfeits have been. He knows what you really need. And, you know, we're not here to try and force anything, make anything happen, because he knows. He knows you. But if you feel like he's speaking, you feel like he's touching your heart today, then why leave it another day? Why not just encounter with him this morning? Let him embrace you today. Say, Lord, I let go of the counterfeits. Why don't you just say that with me this morning? Just close your eyes where you are. Just say, Lord, I let go of the counterfeits. Things that I've been trying so hard in my own strength to be loved, to be enough, to belong. Where I've tried to change me so others will like me. Lord, it hasn't worked. I need you. I need your love. I need a transforming encounter with you. Hmm. Well, why don't you just stand where you are? Just, just stand where you are. Just, maybe just lift your hands to him this morning. Just lean into him a little bit. We're just going to worship together. Lord, thank you for your presence, for, for your gentle presence here. He's healing hearts. He's restoring hearts. It's not easy, you know, to let down the walls. But they've never really protected you. They've just shut out the very thing you needed. Some of us are walking with shame. It's poisonous. It's poisoning your heart. Shame's just simply saying to you, you're unworthy of love. Guilt saying, oh, you did this, you did that. The shame saying, yeah, that's because that's who you are. But it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Because you're his child. You're his son, his daughter. He says, you can't do it without me, so why not let me into that place, that place in your heart? Why don't we just sing?